I would say most well prepared session that it go and I could see the background work uh, homework that you had done before coming here with the variety of topics who talks about the specific topics so uh thank you so much vinak and team for for doing that uh before we uh, let you complete and go out of stage on behalf of isa team i would like to take this opportunity and thank you with a virtual memento from our side uh vinak thank you very much thank you thank you samir thank you so much for your time thank you for uh, that gesture <laughs> alain thank you so much for joining it all over the Good. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Sudarshan, thank you so much. Yeah, really, it's a pleasure and a real surprise. Thank you so much. Great session. <laughs> I learned a lot. Yeah. Thank you. So, so with that, I think we'll get into uh, the next session, which many of us uh, will become student here, and and then welcome our uh, uh, professors uh, and the directors from the three premium institute that we have. Uh, as i get them on board uh, uh, I, i i'll introduce each one of you you can try to switch on your camera uh, and 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 your audio button and and be ready uh, to get on to the stage to start with uh, my privilege to uh, uh, introduce professor ram gopal rao who is the director of iit delhi uh, he is currently the director before joining iit delhi as director in april 2016 he served as a pk kelkar chair professor for nanotechnology in the department of electrical engineering and as the chief investigator for the center of excellence in nano electronics project at iit bombay dr rao has over 450 research publications inventor of 44 patent applications which include uh, 11 of those patents have been licensed to industries for commercialization professor rao is a co-founder of two deep technology startups at iit bombay nano sniff and soil sense which are developing products of relevance to the society dr rao is a fellow of ieee a fellow of the indian national academy of engineering the indian academy of sciences the national academy of sciences and the indian national scientific science academy he is recipient of many awards including santi swaru bhatnagar prize infosys prize swarna jayanti fellowship award from department of science and technology the ibm faculty award research uh, award from intel asia and many more he also won the techno mentor award from the industry uh, indian semiconductor association and, and an excellence in research award from iit bombay professor rao welcome my pleasure to invite our next speaker uh, professor ajit kumar chaturvedi who is the director of iit roorkee uh, dr chaturvedi received the btech mtech and phd degrees in electrical engineering from iit kanpur in 1986 88 and 1995 respectively he served the department of electronics engineering at iit bhu varanasi and he joined the faculty of department of electronics and computer engineering at iit roorkee uh, in 96 in 99 he moved to the indian institute of technology kanpur where we held the positions of hod of electrical engineering dean of research and development and deputy director he is now the director of iit roorkee he is the coordinator of bsnl <coughs> iitk telecom center of excellence which has done a large number of projects for indian telecom sector he is a recipient of insa teachers awards the distinguished teacher award of iit kanpur and tant in to an fellowship of nanyang technical university in singapore is a founding member of telecom standards development society of india his research interests are in communication theory and wireless communications we welcome you sir and and then we have the third uh, uh, speaker uh, professor baskar ramamurthy who is the director of iit madras dr ramamurthy got his btech in electronics from iit madras in 80 and his ms and phd in electrical engineering from university of california of santa barbara after working at at&t bell laboratories for a couple of years he joined the faculty of iit madras his alma mater in 86 and took over as director of iit madras in september 2011 his areas of specialization are communications and signal processing his research work in wireless networks modulation wireless data and audio and video compression He has awarded the University of California Regents Fellowship. 
is the founding member of Tenet Group of IIT Madras, active in developing telecom and networking technologies and incubating companies to develop and market products based on this. He is currently also honorary director of the Center of Excellence in Wireless Technology, a public-private initiative at the IITM Madras Research Park to make India a wireless technology center. He is a fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineering and Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineer. Uh, he has won many awards, including honorary fellow of the International Medical Sciences, Vasvik Award for Electronic Sciences and Technology, Tamil Nadu Scientist Award, and the ISA Technovisionary Award in the year 2011. So, a pleasure to welcome you, sir. And 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 to welcome uh, the three speakers, we have Dr. Satya Gupta, who is the chairman of IESA, uh, who will uh, who I welcome to take this discussion forward and let us all hear about the director. Vision. Over to you. Uh, so good afternoon, Professor Rao, uh, Professor Bhaskar, and Professor Chaturvedi. Uh, thank you for joining this session. Um, as a part of the, uh, the ecosystem, the academia and R&D is one of the most important wing uh, of overall electronics and semiconductor ecosystem. Uh, so I think this session was put together to uh, listen from you. What is the technology vision for this sector? in a long-term sense, where we are heading, what are the new trends, what are the new technology we have to work, whether it's in nanoelectronics, communications, wireless. Uh, I think you are, in your individual capacity, uh, uh, leading researchers in this area. Uh, so <coughs> we'll start with Professor Rao, uh, and we will have about, about 10 to 12 minutes of your individual views uh, on the direction and trends in the electronics and semiconductor industry and after that we will have uh, uh, some discussion among yourselves uh, that what should india do from creating a long-term self-reliance in this area by focusing on the r d uh, so professor Rao, take it from here thank you very much uh, dr sachi gupta so my area of specialization is more into nano electronics and of late I have been focusing on uh, more and more of uh, the interdisciplinary aspects of nanoelectronics. In fact, if you ask me the, the CMOS kind of technologies, you know, there is not much India can do because uh, you know, things have all almost saturated and, uh, and uh, the semiconductor industries are leading the, the whole race for the next generation and all of that. But for example, one of the activities where I am particularly focusing on is a bottom up approach for the for the nano electronics and when i say bottom up approach you know almost all dimensions on a cmos chip are shrinking and they are shrinking to a level where we are now almost counting atoms so since we are counting atoms one of the questions that is being posed everywhere is can we use a bottom up approach can we you know build a materials using self assembled monolayer you know assembly kind of processes which chemists have been working on. So, so one way, you know, uh, one can handle the scaling challenge, you know, which is where academic institutions, there is a lot of uh, work happening currently is a, a kind of a combination of top down and bottom up. The industry is mostly focusing on top down, where keep on shrinking the dimensions. And uh, now in the academia, there are lots of efforts now in growing materials of, for a variety of applications in the CMOS. And then, you know, build, integrate these two processes some bottom up, some top down, and, and see if you can push the boundaries of the current technologies further. That is where most of my research has currently been uh, focused on. And uh, that is also where, for example, I've been working with uh, many industries. Uh, I've also been working with uh, many industries, including applied materials and various others. So that is one of my activities right now. And, uh, and for example, there we have shown how you can uh, use uh, uh, you know, for example, uh, the copper diffusion barriers, which are grown using uh, a bottom up processing and all of therefore top down bottom up chemistry and uh, and uh, nano electronics. I think coming together is where some of my focus has been. And the other major area of interest now in academia is on sensors. You know, if you look at the sensor platform, there are still, you know, lots of applications where sensors are required. 
I have spent considerable amount of my time as a as a faculty member in developing low cost sensing platforms. Let us say for a, for explosive detection. For example, can we develop electronic systems, an electronic nose kind of a platform, which can replace a sniffer dog? That has been the 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 need of the hour right now. All security agencies are asking for such systems which can sniff explosives, like what a sniffer dog would do. Because in a traditional electronics, you know, out of the five senses that we have as humans, the the uh, eyes part of it, the vision part of it is already captured very well in terms of cameras, and the touch part of it also is is uh, already captured, and the and and the and uh, you know, but the kind of things that are not really the hearing part is also very well very well captured. The things which are not captured very well is the taste and the smell. So therefore, can we have electronic tongue kind of platforms or electronic nose kind of platforms and integrate them with traditional electronic, uh, you know, com consumer electronics and see if you can, you know, do things uh, in the next generation. For example, an electronic nose platform integrated with a mobile phone, you know, can allow you to 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 detect explosives before they go off. It's like a mobile phone becoming a sniffer dog. So some of these have been. Uh, you know my areas of interest. These are all even more than more kind of uh, uh, areas where you are trying to bring very diverse platforms onto the silicon chip. Very diverse kinds of processes, like I said, the bottom up from top down onto the CMOS platforms and push the boundaries of the traditional technologies and also the the, the kind of commercial systems that you see today in the market. So so I think I have been working on uh, healthcare platforms for diagnosing cardiac patients, explosive detector platforms for sniffing applications, and agriculture also is a huge uh, domain area now. In the agriculture, there are hardly any technologies available for Indian farmers. Simple soil moisture sensors, you know, they again, uh, kind, in the kind of an IoT sort of a fashion, very low cost sensors, which can, uh, which can sense the moisture content in the soil in a field, and then deploy the irrigation systems or control the irrigation systems either to save water or even to boost productivity because if you are able to control the soil moisture then you will be able to even optimize the yield uh, for the field so therefore you know some of these sustainable agriculture sort of issues also are uh, of major importance and even the low cost sensors for example for the micro and macro nutrients the npk sensors now today when a farmer needs to do the soil testing the farmer has to go to the agricultural lab and you know the agricultural labs cost money and then you know they are difficult to set up in remote areas the, the there is a time factor involved there is a cost factor involved you know one of the things uh, which we are looking at in academic institutions is developing these micro and macro nutrients the sensors for these micro and macro nutrients and then uh, make them very low cost make them portable and then build uh, you know these in the villages and then develop this village into entrepreneurship kind of a model where there are entrepreneurs in the villages you know who will now be able to use these sensors take them to the fault and farms and provide service to the farmers i think that is again where not only the technology innovation uh, but also you need business model innovation to make the indian agriculture profitable and that is again where there are lots of efforts currently going on and my group is also very actively involved in developing some of these sensors. So out of these activities, we have two startups now. The first startup is on uh, is NanoSniff, which is now able to commercially market a, a, a kind of a vapor phase uh, or a low cost uh, explosive detector, which is already in the in the market now. It is called NanoSniffer. And then we have another uh, company, which is the Soil Sense. Now they have already marketed the soil moisture sensors in an IoT kind of a nodes. And uh, and then we are also now commercializing the the NPK sensors, the nitrate, phosphate, and potassium sensing for the for the agriculture. So I think you know one of the ways now we are trying to take these technologies to the market is through startups because that now in academia we have figured out is working very well. There are enough government of India schemes, and while industries have a reluctance to work directly with academic institutions, but they are very eager to engage with uh, with the startups. And then through these startups, which are becoming now a kind of a bridge between academia and industry, I think you know it's also becoming a win-win proposition for everybody. 
um, and while the industry interactions are on an upward swing, but I think the startups are also helping us now bridge the gap between academia and industry, which is evolving a very interesting uh, way in the in the country today, and uh, that's also a good sign that is happening. If you look at the overall technology trends, you know I call them five T's. These are the five T's how the progression is happening in the country. The first T is the IT, the information technology. India has captured the world market. You know, India is known as, as an IT giant now in the world and a lot of great things are happening on the IT sector from India. So therefore, IT is where I think things are already very well established. After the information technology comes the biotechnology. Now, even in the biotechnology sector, India is doing very well. In fact, I am told every second medicine sold in the US is actually manufactured out of India. And all the vaccines now, India has already captured the market. And even for the COVID now, probably India will position itself in the, at the center stage, where, you know, in terms of vaccine development and all that. So in the biotechnology, again, India has done very well and doing very well. And there is a huge growth opportunity. Now, thanks to this Atmanirbhar Bharat and all of that, you now Indian biotechnology industry is also reinventing itself. And I think a lot of great things are happening in the bio sector. Now, the third technology, the T is nanotechnology. In the nanotechnology sector, India has again invested quite a bit of money. Starting from early 2000s onwards, India has started the nano mission kind of a thing, which Abdul Kalam in Rashtrapati Bhavan initiated. And in the nanotechnology domain, India again is ranked third in the world when it comes to research and development. If you look at the, the research papers coming out of all the countries and then uh, look at even their impact, you know, India is doing pretty well. In terms of the number of papers, India is now at the third position, only behind China and US. So we are generating a lot of knowledge in the nanotechnology domain. Now the time has come to convert that knowledge into wealth. That is again, a lot of startups are coming up now in the nanotechnology domain. And I can name at least a dozen startups in the nanotechnology space from academic industry, from academia, which are again beginning to become big and which have already launched the products. And many of these nanotechnology companies have come out of very well established institutions and all of that. So that is the third T where again India is doing very well, IT, BT, and NT. Now, what will come next? The next, uh, next revolution will be in the cognitive technologies. In the cognitive technology domain, again, where you put the artificial intelligence, machine intelligence, and data sciences kind of areas. In cognitive technology space, India has again launched major initiatives from IIT Delhi. In fact, we have just approved a new school for artificial intelligence, and we have already received close to $10 million kind of funding from our alumni. And you know, we are now going in a big way into the, into the artificial intelligence area. A lot of academic programs are getting launched. In terms of research impact, India is currently at the fifth or sixth position in terms of the AI, ML kind of research. And our computer science departments are also scaling up. The multidisciplinary culture that needs to come in in the artificial intelligence area in the cognitive technology space is what we are trying to address through the creation of new schools. Because computer science departments in India have traditionally been very discipline focused. They will work on the core aspects of AI, ML technologies, but they will not, for example, may not be able to interact with biologists and, uh, and atmospheric scientists and all of them to develop applications. That is where the school kind of a concept, which uses the platforms developed in a traditional CSE department, applies it to multiple domains, is what we are looking at as a model to scale up the AI, ML areas in the country. So, so therefore, the cognitive technologies is where India needs to capture the next wave uh, of uh, markets and uh, knowledge and all of that. And we are making good enough preparations there and government of India, even through various budgetary allocations, you know, is also allocating funds now. And I am hopeful India will pitch itself very well in the cognitive technology area. So that is the fourth T. So therefore, it all started in 80s with the information technology. Then we moved to the biotechnology. Then we are now in this in the space of nanotechnology where we are doing very well knowledge generation point of view, but the application point of view, we need to capture the markets now. Now the, the, the fourth T is the cognitive technology where we are still not on the world map when either in terms of knowledge generation or in the applications. That is where academia is now preparing itself. 
and i would think that in the next decade or even this decade we will definitely be able to do very well in the cognitive technology space to startups to established industries and academia producing manpower and even building platforms for taking it to the next level the five the fifth t in my opinion is going to be the quantum technologies so after after the cognitive technology the quantum technology revolution is now beginning to start quantum technologies are going to again impact a large set, uh, number of sectors now for example you know defense is already terribly worried because once the quantum technologies come in all the traditional kind of uh, you know methods that we are using for cryptography can be broken by these quantum computers so if your conventional cryptography technologies are not going to serve any purpose in the post quantum era you know then you need to redevelop all of those protocols all of those technologies so the defense is now investing very heavily into quantum technologies and again government of india has launched allocated 8000 crores for the quantum technology initiative uh, department of science and technology is already preparing itself now to fund large projects in the quantum technology space so therefore the quantum technology is what will be the the next generation of or the next wave of uh, technology so therefore if you look at uh, you know five decades i would classify those five decades in these five areas it bt nt ct qt and these are the platforms now whatever you may do with this is going to be in the application space and that is where one will make money and uh, and therefore the science and technology part will happen in the academia and academia is also now getting into uh, the startup space in a major and in an aggressive way so therefore much of this knowledge we are generating in academia can also be delivered to the society in all of these platform technologies through the startup kind of a route but i think you know the the industry academia collaborations are very very key now for us to be impactful in any of these technologies unless an industry and academia comes together works with each other i think neither the industry will be very effective nor academia will be very effective and uh, academia will work for american industry while indian industry will get knowledge from the american universities i think that model is not going to work yeah. you know most thank you professor is, yeah i think can we uh, conclude we have to we are out of time so if yeah, can anyway, we next so one that yeah. is all what i yeah. had to say thank you very much okay uh, ka, professor bhaskar can you share your views in next 10 to 12 minutes Professor Bhaskar, your video audio is not on. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to share my screen. Okay. Uh, just a second. Yeah, can you all see the presentation? Yes, yes. come. Okay. So I want to speak about uh, in semiconductor industry and Indian R&D. Uh, with input from my colleagues, uh, Akshay Nagendra, Anirudh, and Deepak. So, now how do we compare with other technologies in the country? Uh, areas where India has developed complex technologies and taken it to market. Mostly, these are in technology denial areas: missiles, aircraft, space vehicles, even fintech. That's not. That's one of the uh, exceptions. It's not a technology denial area. Uh, radars and associated monitoring and control systems. You know, nationwide uh, monitoring systems, nuclear reactor, ship design. uh these they are all characterized by being areas where technology is denied and to the country and also they are not therefore subject to very aggressive time to market challenges you know you uh, very often when you develop technology in other areas where it's uh, competitive you may get it right but if you get it right too late then also you can't uh, succeed uh the progress also may have been fitful in some cases we may we may have had stop start uh, kind of uh, progress but we have made progress uh on the other hand if you take the very large vertical which is semiconductors and applications of indian r&d to semiconductors i think the progress is not comparable even in uh, even in uh, sec but in parts of this area field where the technology is is in uh, is not available to the country for some uh, strategic reasons so this is something that we have to address um, and the oh sorry i don't know what happened just a second please the opportunities uh, are there in uh, you know in both fabulous design uh, capabilities are very good even at cutting edge i would say uh, 
um, uh, we are doing ICs are being delivered, uh, but mostly through established players, uh, global players as marketing channels. Even if the IC is fully developed by uh, uh, by uh, some company here, a startup, they usually sell it under the uh, umbrella of a, of a global major, or they license IP. There's no significant Indian brand, Indian company selling ICs in any application area in India or globally. Uh, even in packaging and test, we don't have any big player in the space. There are some niche players in uh, multi-chip module space, particularly MMICs, photonics, and so on, uh, but uh, no big player. The one second. Yeah, in Indian R and D in industry, uh, we have leading global companies that do fabulous designs in India. Uh, we think many of them uh, get their chips uh, designed here. Some of the work that goes into these designs are state of the art. Um, not all of it, but good part of it is. Uh, some startups are designing chips on their own, cutting edge in terms of performance, frequency of operation, optimization of power, space, mixed signal capabilities, and so on. In academia, the, I think we had a very good overview from uh, my colleague, Professor Ram Gopal Rao. Most of the contributions in IC design and semiconductor fabrication, fabrication of sensors, and so on, are all at the level of global knowledge. You saw very good examples being given by my colleague. Ideas are published and patented and are incorporated by global industry in some cases. There's no direct link to any Indian industry uh, because of uh, you know the huge gap in Indian industry also. Um, the indirect benefit to Indian industry is knowledge manpower. A lot of our students uh, do very well and are available to these companies. Uh, what are the new opportunities that we have for Indian industry and Indian r and I would say that in fabulous design, uh, we could focus on chips that have a market due to technology denial or due to supply chain or cyber security uh, risks. And I'll give some examples for these. Uh, chips that go into IoT subsystems, again, my Ram Gopal Rao mentioned this, which are part of complete solutions sold out of India. So while we may not yet have a company that's uh, globally selling chips, so you could have, uh, we do have companies that globally sell solutions, uh, which involve a lot of, uh, uh, you know, sensors and uh, uh, subsystems which uh, actuate and sense and so on and these uh, uh, when these some complete subsidy systems are sold uh, solutions are sold one could uh, make chips that go into them and uh, in packaging and sub assemblies i think there are new multi technology packaging uh, uh, you know when i say multi technology what i mean is different fabrication technologies of sensors silicon actuators all getting together into one package this is a new area, and I think India could do well to get into this early. And also, you know, work with global majors, set up traditional assembly and test uh, for chips designed in India and wafers that are obtained from fabs elsewhere. So there's no reason why the chips could not be sold out of India. Many of the majors who design chips here actually sell them out of a third country. And uh, the fabs in the emerging areas, such as gallium nitride and silicon carbide, again, get in early on the ground floor. I'll give you three examples, uh, uh, which in which somewhere I think I'm able to give you these examples only because in some fashion IIT Madras faculty are involved with these. So I have I know a little bit more about them. I'm sure there are many other examples, maybe even better ones, but uh, these are the only ones I am aware of uh, with sufficient depth. So here's an example of a chip that addresses uh, supply chain security issues. You know, it, it really it's a chip that uh, doesn't exist because uh, it doesn't have a very high volume, but uh, you know, and you have to get you have to, make, you have to increase the volume by trying to make it uh, usable in a wide variety of applications, so that you can own the chip and you can uh, have security in terms of supply chain. So, you know, if you develop radio transceivers, uh, which is my own specialization for uh, applications, particularly in defense, you find that there are a wide variety of radios that are used by them, wide variety of bands, and wide variety of modulation formats. Not just communication chips, even radars and so on. Everything from Tens of megahertz to tens of a couple, you know, uh, 10, 20 gigahertz, bandwidths ranging from tens of kilohertz to hundreds of megahertz. And uh, usually they are made with the chips that are available in the global market. Um, volumes are low, lifetimes of these products are very long, and supply chains are a big issue. Um, so one can develop a single IC actually that works for most of these applications. Carrier frequencies ranging from as low as 30 megahertz all the way up to 12 gigahertz, wide bandwidths from very small bandwidths to 200 megahertz. 
there is uh, external component count, the power consumption, etc., may be a little higher than for ICs that are specifically optimized for different applications. Uh, so, you know, the, I'm not going to go into this detail, but this sort of gives you an idea. You have a chip that has all the major components that go into an RF system, you know, the receiver side, the transmitter side, filters, uh, programmable filters, uh, A2D converters, d converters, direct access to the analog signals and so on, and synthesizers for a wide range of frequencies. Another example of, and you know, if you make such a chip and own it, so you can actually, uh, the volume can be increased across all sorts of platforms from simple handsets, communication sets to, to tactical radios, to, uh, to uh, weapon systems and so on. And you can also ensure that you have a secure supply chain. Uh, here's now an area where uh, things are just beginning all over the world is an area where we can get in early. And uh, when you get in early, of course, you have a much better access to the market. This is millimeter wave IC design. A um, lot of things special about it. The multiple streams of data at RF and baseband in these, in these kind of systems today. Uh, there are lots of issues on uh, regarding on-chip coupling. Data speed is very high. So what used to be called analog baseband is now actually RF in terms of the design uh, rules. Uh, there's a lot of significant uh, EM simulation challenges. Antenna and uh, IC have to be co-designed. There are lots of effects uh, on the chip in, uh, in power amplifiers. So, you know, it's an area where uh, the ultra-fast CMOS technologies are required for high-volume ICs, but also new processes like gallium nitride, which I just mentioned, are very useful for the high-speed, high-power technologies. There are applications not just in 5G, but also in vehicular radar and defense. So the, in this area, chips are just beginning to come out in large, in low, at low cost and high volume. If we get in early, uh, you can grow with the uh, with the uh, others and grow with the market. Wait a few years, it'll be too late. Packaging and test. Now, this is something that even comes before you set up wafer fabs, and uh, we, we don't even have the conventional ones that just take wafers, dice them, and package them. But also, there are these new packages that I mentioned. So, you know, the new packages, uh, kind of sensors that uh, Ram Gopal was mentioning, which are all very often have multiple fabrication technologies. So, here's just an example my colleague shared with me. They're both semiconductor and glass, wave, glass uh, wafers, which have to be uh, placed together. And uh, this is a bio biochip. Now, these kinds of packaging are all becoming very important going into the future. And this might go into a IoT, as in an IoT subsystem, a wearable or a something. And uh, really, uh, anybody, and there's a lot of software involved, a lot of backend cloud based stuff involved. So those strengths can be leveraged to create a market for these chips instead of just becoming a global chip supplier. You know? So um, this is these kinds of things are now emerging, and this is uh, again good to get in on the ground floor. Uh, here's another example from a very different area. This is a uh, field programmable uh, photonic gate arrays. Uh, this is from a paper that was published very recently. But these are the kind of things that I think we have to get in on the ground floor, uh, you know, in, in the packaging space. And of course, you, you have to also build up the conventional packaging capability. I think uh, there are enough uh, uh, chips which are being designed in India, as I said, fabbed outside, but also packaged elsewhere and sold out of a third country. There's no reason why they cannot come back, package here and sell out of India. Um, and here's an example which is a little further away from semiconductors directly, though the very related product, and that is displays, you know, so one of the things that has happened is, you know, if you look at all the displays that go into phones, particularly the new ray, new generation of AMOLED displays, uh, you know, they're all uh, derived from large TV display manufacturing. Uh, you, you make a two meter by two meter kind of uh, displays and cut them. And, uh, the, but the fact of the matter is that the volumes are now in the small displays. TV display volumes are coming down. These are very high capex, low agility kind of manufacturing processes. Um, one could go to other processes which involve, which sort of go from economy of size to economy of speed. Uh, you make small displays, but you decouple it from TV, TV display manufacturing technology. You have a fast process uh, which can make small displays with, uh, you know, times for uh, output of each display, which are comparable to uh, what you can get for uh, others, uh, you know, uh, product, other components that serve the same market. And uh, significant reduction in incremental capex. That means as you want to build up volumes, you can keep adding capex. So very different uh, manufacturing process uh, and uh, investment model. These are the kind of things that I think we have to focus on in India. And if we do all this, I think we'll set up the ecosystem, the size of the industry to be able to actually uh, make economic sense to have a fab in the country. So with this, I'd like to uh, end. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bhaskar. Uh, I think very detailed, broad uh, 
perspective and also on time. Uh, so moving on to Professor Chaturvedi, uh, can you share your views uh, on the subject and future of the research and uh, uh, how the academic institutions can play a role in this ecosystem? Right. So first, uh, let me thank uh, Indian Electronics Semiconductor Association for uh, designing this session for uh, IIT directors to share their vision. And I think it, it definitely is a platform that helps us in putting across what is the viewpoint from the academia. Uh, while it is very well understood and appreciated that any industry to grow, um, especially the semiconductor industry in India, I think the key driver has to be innovation. And if innovation is the key driver, then the natural question is that what is it that the industry should be doing? And the theme that my thoughts are going to present now is that the, if you want to drive innovation and thereby take the industry higher and higher, the only way forward is to come closer to the academia. That should be the theme. And for that, there are several small, small, small steps which can be taken and both parties can come closer and collaborate more and more. And I would, for that purpose, what I would do is I would start with the, with the problem of designing the engineering curriculum, which I think is not uh, appreciated in the industry as much as it is required to be appreciated, so that there is a better understanding of both sides. See, the engineering curriculum tries to balance two contradictory goals. One goal is that we want the curriculum to be as close to the industry as possible, cutting edge industry, latest industry. And at the same time, we want our students to be ready for the next 40 years because industry and technology will keep on changing, but our students should remain relevant for a very long period of time. So in that sense, we need to teach them basics. We need to teach them science, fundamentals, principles. When, when we are able to do that, only then they will have a long-term vision. They will have a, the ability to be what we say as uh, horses for the long race. That kind of capability will come only from them. But if you look at cutting, cutting edge technology or industry or whatever the industry needs as of now, then what is happening is that on one hand, the duration of the program cannot be increased to beyond four years, if I'm talking of the undergraduate curriculum. But on the other hand, the research, the development, the technology, all these things rapidly increase. Now, if they rapidly increase, then how will you bring them, bring them into the curriculum? And that is where the challenge is. Challenge is how to retain what is the basic and how to bring in what is the current. And in this exercise, I think industry, once it starts appreciating this, this inherent contradiction in designing the curric curriculum, it will come closer to the academia. It will become part of the academia in that sense. And we can bring in very, very innovative models to improve the curriculum and at the same time to drive innovation. Let me elaborate this point. So what I'm saying is that when I teach a course in communications, my research area is physical layer communications, wireless communications, information theory. During the course of my teaching, I very often need case studies, practical examples, illustrations. Those illustrations, instead of bringing it necessarily from research papers or textbooks, I can bring in from the Indian academia, Indian industry. But for that, I need to get those examples from the Indian industry to be able to talk about them in my class, to be able to talk to them about my to MTech students and PhD students. And this exercise can be done if both parties come together, create more and more interesting case studies which have happened in the Indian industry, which can also be used as a good example so that the student feels good that whatever basics is being taught, those basics have been directly applied in the industry. And that way, he will also come closer to the industry. And if those case studies are from the Indian industry, he will come closer to the Indian industry. Second thing is that when we design like projects, whether it is uh, projects within courses or whether these are standalone projects, or whether these are uh, MTech level projects or even PhD level dissertations or thesis. We necessarily have to work in specialized areas. In specialized areas, it means that we have to go deeper and deeper so that 
the research that is done is appreciated at the international peer level. It gets published in the best journals in the world. Those kinds of things have to be done. But what happens is that when you do that exercise, it is very difficult to show that this innovation can actually be applied to some industry product or some something that is relevant to the industry in the next five to 10 years. And for that, what I believe is, is that it is possible that we can create modules, we can create uh, subsystems where it is possible to replace the innovations, especially in the physical layer innovations that we do. And we can immediately demonstrate that we don't need to wait for the complete product development, complete cycle of product development, complete cycle of IC design or IC cycle design. We can immediately show that what are the advantages that are happening either in the delivery of voice or in the consumption of power or in terms of the quality or in terms of the networking ability. All these things can be readily shown without waiting for the entire product cycle to be developed. Currently, what happens is that many of these things we end up showing in simulations and naturally these simulations will not be that stimulating to the student or to the general public to be able to absorb the the inherent potential of these innovations and so that is why it sort of that cycle gets interrupted and that cycle does not proceed forward so i believe that again if uh, academia and industry some professors from academia and uh, some industry people who have the experience can come together we can create more and more such modules and subsystems where those innovations, algorithmic innovations can be shown to be leading to actual difference in the products. And that is why then the, then the, the, the fire in the belly will come to be able to create startups, to be able to create more and more uh, industries which can design those products and take them to the market. Otherwise, that, that fire doesn't come if you just do uh, MATLAB simulations or, or if you just do some simulations and at, at that level. Uh, changing gears, if you want me, I mean, in terms of what is my vision for the next 15, 20 years, what do I see the research happening? So in that sense, my, my vision is if we can see something that we have struggled for the last three decades and we have not seen it. And that is if we can bring the, the hardware industry on one hand, the physical layer people on the middle, and the networking people on the third end. So there are three layers, and these three layers are working in complete silos. I mean, they have very little understanding of each other, very little interfaces between these layers. And as a result, result what happens is that we are not able to do an optimization, which is a system-wide optimization, or an optimization even which covers at least two layers, maybe the hardware in the communication physical layer or the physical layer of the network, not to talk of all the three levels of innovation. So, so that is, of course, something that is that I hope will happen in the in the couple of decades. It is not something that is limited to India alone. It is something that is for the world at large. And I see that that is the way forward for for electronics industry, for semiconductor industry to grow, especially in the area of uh, communications. The last point that I want to make is, and again, this point may be very relevant for this kind of forum is that uh, semiconductor industry as well as the the IITs and the NITs, both the sides need to appreciate the efforts of their own people in bringing academia and industry closer. So if a, if a professor is doing something which, 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 can be, which can lead to some industry contributions, which can lead to a startup, which can lead to innovation, I think the recognition that is expected or the effort that has to be recognized within academia probably is less, probably more rec effort recognition can be given to that so that more and more people take up that kind of exercise. And similarly, in the industry, I think it is uh, business oriented, which is fine. It has to be business oriented if it has to survive. But for the sake of business itself, I'm saying to, to instill more innovation, to bring more innovation, it is important to come closer to the academia. Without that, I don't see that, uh, that uh, innovation will happen. And so you also need to rec recognize your own people who make efforts to come closer to the academia and try to create opportunities for either funding research or for uh, funding projects or even undergraduate uh, case studies and things like that. If more and more such things happen, then of course, uh, what we are seeing, the, the kind of vision that, that we want to see, that, that vision will turn into uh, a reality. I think I would like to close my uh, remarks here and would be happy to take questions. You are muted. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor. Um, 
I think uh, in interest of time, I'll just pose one question to all three of you and expect a very short answer. If you have to pick up three products, whatever you feel like, like with a chip system, these things, which industry and academia can design together, uh, I want specific products which can help the Indian ecosystem, uh, especially as Professor Rao talked about uh, agriculture. IESA is very focused on a concept of ATMAS, A-T-M-A-S, agriculture, medical, transformative education, uh, uh, automobile, and strategic security. So uh, considering these are the basically heart and soul of India, if you can just list out three products each, which we can all design together, industry and academia coming together and put it out, which is the need of the country. Uh, if you can share the, just basically any three products. Thank you. And we can start with Professor Rao and then go to Professor Bhaskar and then Professor Chaturvedi. Yeah, the three products to me, the first one will be, you know, agriculture, where uh, very low cost network, uh, you know, precision sensors for uh, micro macronutrients in the soil, which a farmer in a village can be, can operate with the help of a village entrepreneur who is a 10th pass kind of a graduate. I think the, the technology should be simple enough, easy to use. I think their academia industry collaboration can can take us you know a very long way because the, it requires multidisciplinary kind of a background which exists in academia but also the business model innovation the funding all of that can come from the the industry so i think agriculture is one place uh, for uh, boosting the you know for doubling the farmers income i think there uh, all of these technologies are needed the second thing to me is in the healthcare sector again you know even in delhi where i am sitting right now you go just 100 kilometers away, there is nothing present in terms of any advanced healthcare. Even if a person, you know, uh, 50 kilometers from this place falls ill, has a cardiac problem, the person needs to be rushed to All India Institute of Medical Sciences, which is in the middle of the city. That is the current situation now. So now healthcare infrastructure needs to spread to the, to the remote towns and villages. And that is again where uh, lots of technologies are required for example can we build a health dome a kind of a dome for the for the healthcare where a person walks in and many of the body parameters are monitored some invasively or at the most you can make the person sit on a chair so many of the body parameters are monitored and uh, transmitted to a hospital in a big city or town where the advanced screening will be done and patients uh, can be selectively called to these big cities for treatment purposes. So this is a kind of a preventive health care by using diagnostics and the diagnostics need to be done in a remote kind of a fashion using all the web enabled kind of technologies. There again, I can tell you, you know, academia industry collaboration will go a long way, huge markets, the, the everything exists, the expertise exists. It's just a matter of people coming together and working on it because every year I am told something like uh, two crore people go below the poverty line because of healthcare expenditure. A person coming to a big city for, for treatment purposes goes below the poverty, you goes below the poverty line. And that's Can we go to third example? The last one I would say is environment, monitoring the pollution levels and the Got atmospheric uh, quality and then, you know, using network sensors. These three, in my okay. opinion, are going to be very, very important. Professor Bhaskar? Yeah, I would uh, say that uh, I don't know the exact application, but we need to find a new sensor that uh, makes a lot of sense, a uh, lot of um, business sense for uh, Indian users to want in their smartphone. And we have to leverage the fact that phones are now assembled in India with increasing value addition every year. And we have to, uh, you know, discover this something that becomes, uh, you know, sold in the tens of, uh, you know, uh, tens of millions, hundreds of millions every year. One such major tree will actually open up the whole thing. Uh, this could be a tactile, is something that enhances. See, we depend so much on uh, online uh, modes for uh, secure uh, transactions of all kinds that uh, something that really has very high level uh, compared to uh, passwords and OTPs and so on, 
or it could be something that is useful for uh, you know the, the equivalent of uh, the, how useful the camera has become you know in other in some some maybe a tactile sensor something that really they remember the end i keep telling people remember the entire back back cover of the cell phone is still available for people <laughs> real estate is not short it's not short supply uh, ideas are in short supply number one Number two, I, I think we are short of time, so can we move fast? Yeah. 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 Thank you. I think that's it. The last one I would say is uh, you know something Please. that goes into uh, maybe that will um, really regulate and guarantee uh, with the step with the SLA the water supply uh, to every home. Uh, something an IoT device uh, device that has a sensor uh, measure also to a communication. Uh, people can get the same confidence uh, about their water supply as they have toward today about their data connection. Thank you. Yeah, so I think that's a very good question and I can give you a very precise answer. See, India has done very well in weather forecasting, but unfortunately we are still not able to tell real-time weather to our farmers. I think here it's semiconductor industry can keep the lead and it can actually, IMD is there in a very good weather forecasting, just real-time delivery of weather information to the farmer on his mobile phone. If that can be done and it is very much feasible, it will be a very, very useful device for agriculture production and everything. Second thing I would second thing I would say that you have seen that recent COVID times, some academia, several academic institutes have come forward with, with ventilators. And I'm not sure how many of those ventilators will actually see the light of the day in terms of industry. <laughs> Because, because the business models are required and, and that kind of the business acumen is required of the semiconductor industry and other things. That is, required. that is the second thing I would say. And third, I would say we must take an example from defense. Again, uh, getting, uh, I mean, uh, what has happened in recent times on, the, on our Indian borders, I think it should be a product from defense. I would con conclude here. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I will conclude this uh, session with the uh, one promise and one challenge, right? Uh, so the promise, as Professor Chakravarti said, we are ready from the uh, behalf of the whole industry who is present on this platform. We promise that basically we will work very closely with you. Uh, uh, I think both of us have to take basically a few steps to make this thing because I think this question what you posed is as old as basically when will the fab come in India. I think for the last 20 years since I came back to India, I'm hearing how do we get industry and academia to work together. Uh, same time when we started saying when will the fab come to India. So we are ready from the industry side. On behalf of ISA, I promise all of you that basically we will do whatever it takes to basically make this happen. In terms of the challenge, in terms of the product, uh, a lot of you talk about agriculture, environment and all those things. If, uh, uh, and I will be specific just like you, if we can have a self-powered sensor, uh, which does not require a battery, does not require anything, I think that will help us basically proliferating the sensors in uh, broad, basically, uh, territories of India. So if academia can do the research on self-powered sensor, which does not require any battery, does not require any power, I think that will help in proliferating all the use cases which you guys uh, said are important. So that's a technical challenge. Let's all work together to get it there. Thank you so much for all you being there. And uh, uh, I think Naveen, you can take it from there. Thank you, Satya. And, and then thank you uh, to each of you professors uh, for uh, that engaging session, uh, sharing your thought. Uh, just to quickly share with you what kind of comments and thoughts or questions that were coming in from our audience who were watching this. Uh, two questions which Satya already repeated, saying how can academia and industry work together? We have been talking every year whenever we meet. Uh, you covered that. Uh, there was a question or comments about what are the success stories coming out from the uh, IITs and our educational institutes which we can follow. We covered that. Uh, there were comments also about saying uh, previously the many of these institutes used to be very science oriented, either education or research. But now with many of them starting a business school, uh, a AI ML school and an application basic specific school, 
uh, it kinds of create an institute on itself to, to get the product out from there. So I think we are seeing the sign of that. And lastly, but not uh, the most important one, is that how do we accelerate this? Is the new education policy that was just announced, does that aid in, in general uh, the vision that you folks have been seeing and to connect and make India admirable? or we need more from the uh, uh, policy maker. So that was the theme of questions and comments that was coming. Uh, most of that was answered. So at this time, I'll wrap this session. Uh, before you leave the stage, I would like to take this opportunity and thank each one of you for taking your time out and sharing your visions with us. To start with, Professor Ram Gopal Rao, thank you so much. Professor Ajit Kumar Chaturvedi, thank you so much for taking time. And Professor Vaskar, thank you again for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Satya, thank you for sharing this session. Thank you so much. I cannot be chair in front of all the giants. I am so <laughs> humbled to be in their company. Thank you so much. Okay. So before we go to the next session, uh, uh, can you uh, play the mighty, you know, uh, microprocessor invention challenge, uh, Ganesh? <laughs>